Hey, today we are talking about villains. And I'm going to take you on a journey with me through kind of my own evolution about how I think about villains, both um, when I'm reading stories, what I look for, and when I'm writing them, what I like to put into my book. So in the early part of my life, like many of you who started out with fairy tales, the bad guys were very bad, like irretrievably bad. And I think that's partially because the questions that those stories ask are not about the nature of, you know, can you be redeemed? Or um, what do you do when somebody's a mix of both good and evil? What those stories are asking are questions about like, what are we willing to do to stand against evil? What are we willing to do when we face something that is so much bigger than we are? So a lot of those are really valid and important questions, whether you're old or you're young. That's kind of what I call the fairy tale mentality of the bad guy is very bad and the good guys are most obviously good in contrast. Probably my favorite uh, example of this is Redwall, which was the series that actually inspired me to write my first novel at 11 years old. Redwall is such a fun adventure and you see a very clear distinction between the good guys and the bad guys. The good guys being mice and badgers and squirrels and otters. And then you have the bad guys who are usually things like weasels and ferrets and rats and common vermin um, that people have historically not liked much anyway. <laughs> and very, very rarely do you ever see a rat or a weasel or a ferret or what have you behave in a way that feels moral or that gives you some kind of sympathy for the character. So you really do root for the good guys to overcome the bad guys. And when you have those like epic moments where the Lord of Salamandistron goes charging into the battle screaming Eulalia and just levels all these rats and kills off all the bad guys in this like incredible epic display of power and righteous um, movement, it's inspiring because you see those moments where righteousness prevails and where after all the sacrifice and the craziness and the journey, you see that the people who do the good finally, finally get a chance to basically kind of fix their world, to put things back to peace. Then later on, as I uh, was probably somewhere in my mid-teens, I read The Kestrel by Lloyd Alexander. And the funny thing was, I actually read it totally out of order. It's the second book in a trilogy, and I had read it on its own, not realizing that. It exploded in my mind, because it was the first time I really, really thought about what the dividing line between the good guys and the bad guys are. Because in that book, um, Theo is fighting the Regians. They're the... Um, kind of the neighboring kingdom who are attacking his kingdom. So Theo is one of the um, insurgent leaders who's um, basically fighting guerrilla warfare to protect his country against the Regian invaders. And the interesting thing is that in becoming the warrior that he feels he needs to be in order to protect his country, Theo begins morphing into the very enemy that he hates. And reading about that, while Theo doesn't even realize what's happening to him, but the reader, like I, as the reader, was watching this happening to him, and it was, it was mind-blowing. And I started becoming more aware of the complicated factors within my own heart, the ways in which I am not just all good or all bad, I am mixing those two, and I'm you know, have these moments where I have to figure out what are my motivations? Are they truly good? Or am I being selfish? Um, is there a way to do good for the wrong reasons? Or to do the wrong thing for the right reasons? And suddenly it gets into this whole other complex level of moral quandary. And I'm not even getting into the anti-hero side of things yet. That's a whole nother question. But what I am getting into is the concept that the good guys are closer to the villains then the villains want to believe, and the villains are closer to the good guys than the good guys want to believe. And that brings about the interesting possibility of a redeemable villain. So as opposed to kind of the fairy tale villain who just, you hope he dies at the end, you know, kind of like Lord of the Rings, where you can kill off all the orcs you want, because that is a good thing, ridding the world of orcs is good, 
um, or killing Sauron is good because without those deaths there really would be no chance of the world surviving. But then over against that you have stories like the Kestrel um, and the more kind of young adult, adult type tales where you're wrestling with how do you b bring about justice while still offering your enemy a chance at mercy. And it's been really neat for me to read where you see the main character not just wrestling to save the world from the bad guy, but actually wrestling for the bad guy's soul. The way that Luke Skywalker wrestles for his father's soul. He truly does believe there is still good in his father, and he wants to see his father um, take that step toward redemption before the end. So again, there's no right or wrong to either type of story or type of villain. They both ask different moral questions, but I'd love to know if you prefer either type of villain over the other, either the irretrievably bad villain that you get the satisfaction of just obliterating at the end, or the redeemable villain that you go through all the angst and the desire to see if you can, in the end, redeem them. <laughs>